Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ryan Sutar. I'm one of the senior investment managers here at Sharewise, and we're here with managing director and CEO Jay Upton from Sprintex Limited. Now, Jay's been kind enough to lend us his time and expertise this morning uh, regarding Sprintex, and he's going to start us off with a bit of a presentation regarding the company and an update on how it's traveling, and then we're going to open the floor to a Q&A. So if any participants here today would like to submit questions for me to ask to Jay, please do so through using the Q&A function here on Zoom. Jay, I'll pass it off to you now uh, for the presentation. Thank you very much again for your time. Uh, good, good morning, Ryan. Uh, Ryan. So we're sharing now. You can see the screen. We sure can. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, just a short presentation to introduce you to where Sprintex is at is at, at the present time. Um, so I will just slide into it. Um, this is not allowing me to move slides down, Ryan. Right? Can't go to the next slide. You should just be able to use the arrow keys on your yeah, camera. Well, I'm using it. Yeah, it previously it did, but now it's not. Well, if you just want to bring it back to the traditional slideshow, and then you can just navigate from there. Well, I can see I can see the show, but it won't let me arrow down or. Well, that's all right. Just go back to the traditional PowerPoint, Jay. Okay. So now I need to oh yeah, sure. Not allow me to share the screen. There you go. Let's just go from there. Okay. I'm sorry, we're having a bit of a model here. I don't understand why this is doing this. Sharing this too. I'm sorry if we're not. <laughs> yeah. Can't get it to be full screen now. That's all right. Doesn't need to be full screen. You just okay. navigate from there. That'll work. Now, Okay, now I think we've got it. There we go. Right, now I think we Yeah, you have it now? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Apologies for that. So just to introduce you to the officers of the company, Stephen Appadale, Executive Chairman, um, a lot of experience in Sprintex. He was formerly CEO um, in the years, I think, 2009 to 13. Um, prior to that, he was chairman. He returned to the company in 2021, and currently we've just recently moved him to executive chairman. He was non-exec chairman until about a month ago. Um, myself, myself, um, I was with the company for 
more than 20 years until 2018. <laughs> I left briefly at that time. And um, when the company restructured in 2021, both Steve and I came back to uh, rebuild the company, as it were, and set it off in a new direction, which is what we've done. <laughs> then we have Lee Chen, uh, also executive director. <laughs> Lee is a, a very sharp young man, um, two master's engineering degrees from London universities. His family background is in uh, automotive components, manufacturing um, in PRC. He leads the, the Chinese division and the electric compressor division. Um, and uh, I would say he and all three of us have significant skin in the game. <laughs> the chairman investing a little more than $8 million of his own money into it. Um, Lee has about $2 million in it, and I have around a million myself. So all of us have skin in the game. <laughs> and we all have significant experience of, of what we're doing here. <laughs> so uh, we have four divisions. We're headquartered in Perth, Australia, ASX listed, of course. Um, we have a distribution center in the USA, in Detroit, Michigan, originally focused on the automotive side, which is where we came from. Um, we now have the Sprintex Energy Technology Limited, which is uh, based in Suzhou, China, that houses and was put together expressly to uh, develop the high-speed electric compressor side of the business, which is a, a new expansion for us from 2021. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's led by Lee Chen, who's there on site every day. <laughs> and we have Sprintex Clean Air Malaysia, which originally was a joint venture um, for the automotive program we ran prior. Uh, we've had that operating since 2011. As part of the restructure in 2021, we bought out the JV partner and now own that facility 100%. So all four facilities are 100% owned by Sprintex Limited Australia. So in terms of the current capital structure and what it's projected to become over the coming two years. So right now there's about 550 million shares on issue. Um, very little in terms of debt or convertible notes. We, ha we have a loan from a major shareholder, uh, to which was expressly to complete our production facilities. Um, the only loans we have about $3.6 million in total. Uh, we expect to be repaid in the future from the exercise of options. So in December 24, we have um, 7.5 cent options, which should pay back one of the uh, convertible loans. So we don't ex expect to convert that. And then um, in March of 25, we have 10 cent options, which will raise um, more than more than the entire debt. They'll raise about $4 million and we have about 3.6 total of debt. So, so all of the debt that we have currently um, is expected to be paid back out of the exercise of options over the coming year. And that leaves the company completely debt free. Uh, the performance rights um, sitting out there. I mentioned previously that Stephen Appadale recently was um, moved into the position of executive chairman to essentially to drive the growth because the company is is getting busier every day. Um, we're fairly thinly spread and we're not very top heavy in terms of management. Um, so Steve gets a small salary, but where he really will... Um, do well is if he achieves his two goals the first of which is to be a hundred million dollars market cap for june 25 and the second is to be 250 million dollars market cap for june 26. um so if we include and sorry i forgot to mention additionally all of the directors have performance rights based on revenue milestones um 20 million dollars <clears throat> revenue for june 25 and 30 million for June 26. Um, our current forecasts show that we'll exceed those easily. But um, for us, we, we see that as the, as the right way to remunerate our, our directors and our staff. So every one of the staff is included in that um, ESOP plan. 
So everybody's incentivized to uh, bring this company to the level it should be. So just to um, summarize that, as I said, we have about 550 million shares on issue now. When all said and done, there should be about 687 million, including all of those um, option issues and uh, performance rights issues. In terms of ownership distribution, the top 20 own just about 80% of the company, well, obviously 20% for everybody else. But that does mean that there's you know, probably 120 million shares free to go on the market at the moment. So similar companies, Shinley Compressor, uh, it's also a high-speed electric compressor company in China. Um, Without getting too technical, they work in, in the current high-speed sphere, which is considered to be around 25,000 RPM. We we are aware that there's a lot of problems with the machines that run around that speed. Our machines run about three times faster. So <clears throat> Shenley Compressor has done very well at the moment. They, they've got um, about 100 million revenue for 23. Um, and had their IPO in January 23. So their market cap is about 507 million. And we certainly have at least the, the ability that they have and we'll have the reach that they have uh, over the coming year. Rates, another similar uh, Asian company that produces advanced centrifugal blowers and suspension blowers. E-surging, Seeker Turbo, these are all uh, companies based in China in the same market as us. So in terms of the overall market size, currently the industrial blower market is valued um, at uh, 3.6 billion in 2023, it expected to grow with a CAGR of 5.2% from 24 to 30. And just on that, um, the, the device that we're typically replacing, according to Chinese market research, is currently made about 2 million units a year. So there's a huge market out there for what we're doing. In terms of how we're going to do this, our, our primary strategy is that we will run exclusive distributors in various regions around the world. And we're currently signing up distributors. You, you might have noticed in some recent... Um, ASX announcements, so we have appointed um, distributors for Turkey and other countries. Uh, we're currently in negotiation for the Middle East, for India, for Europe and UK. And those I would expect to be announced soon. Um, we also have a market direct to end users. This is what we're finding is, is as we go to more um, international trade amounts, some larger end users are, are discovering us and, and really very keen to have our product. So we currently have a lot of trials going on with various companies around the world because our product is, is really so different from, from what went before. So we have um, map filtration in Turkey. Um, they have a 90-day trial going on. It's underway at the moment. Flex Bio in Germany. Same thing, Martin Membrane Systems, who make a lot of marine um, wastewater recycling systems. They have units on test at the moment in Germany. Um, Tassel Group in Australia is an interesting one. They, they've already tested a couple of units initially, and they found that one unit was able to do almost the work of three of the current units. So they're excited about that. And now they are operating a case study with 10 units, which will be available to us to show to other people. But Tassels is, is Australia's largest seafood producer you know, in terms of fish farming. And they are owned by Cook Seafood in Canada, which is actually the world's largest seafood manufacturer, if you want. Um, so we we quite um, buoyant about the fact that we've, we've got some very big, very useful players um, testing our products at the moment based on the fact that we can save them 30 to 40% in energy, which, which in any industry, if you can save 30 to 40% in 
energy the energy cost um it's a fantastic advantage and goes directly to the bottom line it'll create a situation where one group has it the other groups will have to have it to compete in terms of price on the product and private labeling is is something that that has come to us in in significant in a significant way in the last couple of uh events and what's happening you know is i was very void to to have the ceo of a competitor manufacturer from italy come to me in germany and say well if i sit here and do nothing i'm going to be left behind so i'm, I'm coming to see you i want to sell your product so in that's very encouraging to us because now we've got very qualified industry peers, CEOs of companies that make compressors, um, coming to us and, and recognizing him. He said to me, he said, this is a game changer. If if we do not do something, we'll, we'll be left sitting on the sideline and you'll be taking all our customers. So we, had, we now have three companies. Uh, one already has units on trial. The second one, we're negotiating the terms of that trial. Um, and a third in the same square. So one of those is an American-based company that manufactures in China, one's an Italian-based company, and, and the other is a French-based company, but all big players in the wastewater treatment market with uh, side chain blow. So those sorts of arrangements, we would expect each one of those to be a minimum of $5 million revenue each year. So we could generate a lot of money simply out of private labeling. The China domestic market is again massive. Just in general, it, it's difficult to explain because of, because the industrial blower market is so so diverse and so large. You know, we started with the idea that we would work mainly in wastewater treatment because it seemed to be the lowest hanging fruit but as we've started to go to market we're discovering many many more applications and today we're finding big applications in the textile industry for air knives in the electronic circuit board production for air knives in food packaging um, almost every industry in the world uses air blowers for something so we it, in the fact that we can save so much energy is really creating a ripple in industry that people just have to have it. And, and we're getting asked every day to, to make new models, new types, which obviously we have to work at our own pace and um, build things one at a time. But right now we have a range of universal blowers which, which will fit probably half of the market and that's still 10 times what we need. So in the China domestic market, currently we have about 11 companies um, trialing our units. All of those are capable of buying um, a significant proportion of our production. Uh, initial production in China is expected to be, or in our forecast, we have uh, 14,000 units in year one, 35,000 units in year two. Um, uh, Actual factory capacity as it stands today it will develop to about 300 units a day or about um, 80,000 units a year. We also have some custom projects going on. Um, we started in the clean energy market and we have around around 16 clean energy programs going on but now we have a couple of uh, very interesting environmental programs one in particular mess water in the netherlands came to us um with a problem basically that they have a patented system to reduce ammonia in animal manure and netherlands is the first country in the world to mandate the reduction of ammonia emissions from livestock farming so at the moment every livestock farm in netherlands is paying a fine for exceeding the ammonia emissions limits so mess water has a, a 
initially a European pattern on a system to reduce that and now has expanded that to a worldwide pattern. Um, they were struggling to find a compressor that, that would do what they needed and we are able to do that. Um, we have the experience in high, high pressure and high temperature compressors from the clean energy market. And the unusual thing for them is they need a compressor that will put up with 90 Celsius input temperature, which is very hot for a compressor. So, um, again, if you look at the ASX announcements, you'll see that we signed a $1 million trial uh, recently with MEST, which is uh, we underway building the first units as we speak. Um, they paid a half million dollar upfront deposit with the other half a million to come on on the initial evaluation units being delivered into Netherlands. And um, we're working with them and we'll send uh, our two key guys, which actually will be Lee Chen and myself, both engineers and, and more capable, very capable. So we will go and ensure that the commissioning of this goes well. Um, <clears throat> but MEST already has uh deposits from about 1200 farmers in netherlands and they according to their um their forecasts and i was actually speaking to the ceo of mesh yesterday and this is a just moving right now into a thirty thousand square meter building to build these things so it's really they're gearing up to a huge size but their their um forecasts show that we should sell more than $100 million into that company over the next five years. So MEST by itself could meet our revenue targets almost. So that's just one. And as I say, we have others. And they're looking to us after the first one. We're going to develop a smaller and a larger similar unit, but in volumes that, and we're talking minimums of $100 million plus over five years. So in the clean energy market, as I mentioned, we have about 16 OE projects around the world. Most of that came out of um, our initial displays in, in Germany at the World Hydrogen Expo a couple of years ago and last year. Um, we have already started the European Ships Program. That program uh, is funded by the European government and it expects to repower six large cruise liners, each of which need 100 megawatts of power is enough to power a town <laughs> um, with hydrogen. And that trial is, is being, or well, actually the hydrogen fuel cell side of it is being put together by a company called Ricardo in the UK, who are leading you know, at least 50 year uh, engineering consultancy for the automotive industry. And they've you know, really taken on the clean energy developments that are going on in, in automotive and, and heavy transport and apply it now to shipping. So that that um, program should use about 300 compressors for us. Um, we have a couple of aviation projects going on, and, and that's really because the, the units we, uh, we've designed and we are building now uh, – by far the smallest, the lightest, and the most power dense compressors available, and the most efficient compressors available. And as most people would understand, you know, weight and size are important in aviation. You know, everything, every part of the airplane's got to get lifted off the ground. It costs energy to do that. So, you know, in many cases, our compressors are one tenth of the weight of the competitor. And then uh, we've recently identified a another angle in clean energy projects which is linear generators we have two larger development companies in the us uh, the one of them has has already raised half a billion us dollars before making anything so we're talking big programs here um these are essentially an opposed piston engine they don't like to call them engines but they they're similar to an engine they have pistons running in a bore, and the pistons pass through a, a electrical coil to generate electricity directly. There's no conrods, no crankshafts, 
very, very simple device, um, very exciting in my opinion from an engineering viewpoint. And these are what I call hybrid programs in that they're ultimately intended to run on hydrogen, but they will run on natural gas or propane or butane or ammonia, the things that are available today. And what that means for us as a company is they can do those things tomorrow. We can, they can deliver that project and it doesn't need any outside infrastructure to make it work because you can buy propane. Natural gas is already plumbed into every factory in the country. So well, in my opinion, these are very, very successful or very, very high potential <laughs> projects. Um, of the two of those, one of them, both of them have uh, samples on test and one of them expects to deliver 300 units in the remainder of 2024 and about a thousand units in 2025 the other is going a little slower um they're talking about 100 units in 2025 but both of those already have uh, existing end user um, agreements to supply these devices so in terms of sprint tax there uh, um very real projects with, with a real outcome and on a real timeline, which in my opinion, most clean energy programs at the moment, whilst they're very exciting and everybody wants to do their, their bit towards um, reducing carbon footprint and, and reducing the use of, of fossil fuels, uh, that's still something that's got a, a long gestation period. I think most companies are not going to do very well out of that until three to five years time but in saying that we are absolutely at the forefront of the development curve and we have uh, new cold calls every week for for companies around the world in in shipping in transport um, and just in general energy supply wanting our product because it's you know it appears head and shoulders above the competition so in terms of our, our own uh, ability to make this product and deliver it, we uh, we have two factories at the moment. The one uh, high-tech facility in Malaysia that was originally uh, put together to build twin screw compressors and has built twin screw compressors for the last 13 to 14 years. And uh, the new factory we've put together with the uh, high-speed electric group in Suzhou and that the production facilities are pretty well complete there we have robotic assembly of, of many parts um, so we're really approaching this as, as more a high tech thing rather than a, a high people use as people might expect in the in China but China today is, is far more advanced in manufacturing terms than most countries in the world so we're, we're going about it the new Chinese way. We have um, some partners that help us. Because essentially, the high-speed electric blowers, um, the, the mechanical side of it, or the air, the airhead side of it, very similar to a turbocharger. And most some people would understand that turbochargers typically need to run about 100,000 RPM to be efficient, and that's why we have these very high-speed blowers. And it's, it's a much more efficient way to work. The clever bit from our side is the ultra high speed electric motors that are that also spin at the same speed as the compressor, which is where a lot of the energy savings come from. Um, so we are building the motor side of it, and we we use contract suppliers to supply the the turbine wheels and the turbine volutes, the simple parts, if you like. But um, many people have asked us a question: Well what's the risk in that of having outside people manufacturing some of your parts? Is it going to disrupt our supply chain or affect our IP? And the fact is that um, we have some some very useful partnerships. Well, Turbocharger is actually a shareholder of Sprintax, not, not a huge bit shareholder, but they are a shareholder. And we've known them for a long time and they're helping us on the supply side. So that company by themselves, they, they make 100,000 
shaft and turbine assemblies for Borg Warner turbochargers, American company, um, every month. So far in excess of, of our sorts of production numbers. And they also make 30,000 complete turbochargers a month. So uh, they're fully familiar with very high volume manufacturing of, of turbocharger and, and high speed compressor parts and able to help us both in, in, in the know-how of, of that side and in the supply chain. There, there are several companies that make nothing but turbocharger pollutants. So it's not like we rely on one company. There's, there's seven or eight of those that don't make anything but that. And they make millions of them a year. So we, we're not really looking like having any problems in terms of supply chain. <clears throat> the the high-speed electric motors are built in-house. And part of the reason for that is they're IP sensitive. Um, we, we have around 21 patents right now on, on the motor side. But at the same time, you know, if you can keep that stuff close to home, there's far more chance of, of keeping ahead. We are ahead of the industry right now. Obviously, the industry is going to catch up. But um, right now, we, we have a clear advantage, and we're trying to hold on to that as long as we can. Covered part of this already. So as part of um, our expansion plan, we will we'll replicate a lot of the assembly initially and then manufacture of the high-speed compressors into the Malaysia factory. So in general terms, the the twin screw compressor side is, is in a bit of decline at the moment. We are looking to identify industrial applications for the twin screw as well, because we are very, very capable in twin screw compressors and have that um, have the facility ready to go and, and operating today so we, we will start to repurpose that into the industrial side as well but we we have enough space to um duplicate the g15 assembly initially and, and later g25 assemblies so that we can assemble and supply in malaysia uh, one of the main advantages of that is that some countries such as uh, the United States, UK at the moment, Turkey is another one, various countries around the world have added an extraordinary tariff to products made in PRC, and that tariff is 25%. So it's quite, a, quite an impediment to some of our competitors. And by, by manufacturing in Malaysia, um, that 25% tariff doesn't exist in US or UK in those places. Additionally, um, in cultural terms, we're finding that some of the Middle East and the Indian subcontinent is is not excited about working with Chinese-made product, and they're much, much happier to buy Malaysian-made product. So for us as a company, it, it, it serves several purposes. It duplicates our our um, manufacturing capability, which, which gives us some risk protection. Now, if something goes wrong with one one facility, then the other facility is still going. Um, and as I say, it, it improves our, our cost, our effective cost in the end user markets because we don't um, struggle with the 25% tariff. So... I've alluded a couple of times to why we're doing this. So our units are smaller, lighter, and more efficient than anything else. Uh, they really are the next generation and they make more air for less, less power. And to, to give our viewers a, a bit of an idea, so this we're in a step change point in technology. So I've been comparing this to the change to LED light globes. Most people are familiar with um, electric light globes in, in houses and buildings and whatever else. So for many, many years, everybody's used 100-watt globes in, in the lounge room and 40-watt and globes in, in the bathroom type thing, and they understand the, the correlation between the amount of energy and the amount of light. Well, today, 
if you go to the grocery store to buy light globes, that you can't buy 100 watt globes anymore. You can only buy 5,000 lumen globes and because that's the amount of light you get from an LED globe. And we're in the same square where we're having to educate the end users not to think about how many kilowatt blowers they need. Because right now, if you need six kilowatt blowers, well, we can do that with a three and a half or four kilowatt blower. So we're going to use less power, but we've got to change the way people think about it. So it's a, a bit like the LED light globe situation. So generally speaking, we, we're providing a, a small little unit that's it's smart in, in terms of you know you buy an industrial blower normally it comes with with three terminals that you connect to the electricity and it runs at a set speed until it dies that's all it can do where our industrial blower comes with a, a logic control or plc a um, hmi which is a touchscreen interface so, and it's capable of, of operating at variable speed it's capable of operating based on a, a set pressure output or a set volume output, et cetera. It has inbuilt protections to save it from uh, failure in, in terms when something goes wrong in the rest of the system. Um, so we have over pressure protection, over temperature protection, um, surge and choke protections, many, many things that, that a conventional blower doesn't have. So it, to some extent in the market, the end users are looking at this little thing and going, well, how can that little thing do what we do with this great big thing over here and how long is it going to last? And I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of uh, trials going on at the moment, and that's really what that's about. People are looking at this thing and thinking, well, it's a little bit hard to believe. It's almost beyond belief that you can save us this much energy and do the same job with this tiny little blower. So we are... <clears throat> We've gone through those trials, and as we come to the end of them, uh, that's when the, the real production and the real demand will start because people will start to understand that this is that much better. I've, I've gone over a little bit of this. Another important point about our blowers is they're much, much quieter than anything else. But, um, I mentioned earlier the 25,000 RPM high-speed blowers. 25,000 RPM is, a, is an unfortunate speed in that it's a, in terms of the sound emission, it's a horrible, very high pitched screaming noise. And um, it's it's also right around the first order of vibration in, in rotating equipment. So that the, we struggle, anything that runs around that speed struggles with needing perfect balance. And they typically need some sort of noise reduction around them you know, on the intake side and, and in terms of acoustic hoods and what have you. Our machines don't need any of that because we're only 72 dB for one meter. And that what that means is, and people who've been at our displays always common. You know, we have a, a compressor running in the booth and we're still talking to each other. And one of the very first questions that industry people ask is, well, why is that blower so quiet? But that's bringing us new markets in the in the in the electronics side of it. Um, printed circuit board <clears throat> production, et cetera, where they might have a hundred blowers running hand lives in the factory. Well, they've either got to build acoustic rooms and everybody in the factory's got to wear hearing protection. With ours, it's not necessary. We also have um, very long service life. Our, our smaller industrial units, which use um, oil-free ball bearings, uh, have an 18 to 20,000 hour service life, and they they can be serviced and go another 18 to 20,000 hours after that. And our larger air bearing units have a service life of 80,000 hours. That's more than nine years of running 24/7, and they don't need anything. They don't need any oil. They don't need a belt. The only thing they need is the filter replacing on the air intake. So virtually zero maintenance for 80,000 hours. So very, very attractive in the industry. <laughs> um, I probably won't run through much of this. I'm, I'm covered a lot of it anyway.
So largely we, we have a range of units. Um, one of the things about our industrial blowers is they're capable of, of more pressure than the competing side channel blowers. But what we're finding as, as a um, development step in the market <coughs> is that currently a lot of systems, a lot of wastewater treatment systems, a lot of air knife systems, a, a lot of different um, industrial processes are designed around the blowers that are available. So the, the side channel blower, which, as I mentioned earlier, <coughs> Chinese research says China makes 2 million a year of those. Um, they're not capable of very much pressure. So we're finding that mark, the market is asking us for lower pressure blowers than we are capable of. Right? I don't mean lower than we can do. I mean lower than we than we think is the most efficient point. <laughs> so effectively, we, we've dumbed down our offering a little bit so that we provide direct replacements for the existing product you know, because that's the fastest way to market for us. But... We will see that change as the end users and the system builders realize that we can provide the same efficiency with higher pressure. They'll start to build higher pressure systems. And just to explain what that means is currently um, a side channel blower can't aerate more than about 2 to 2.5 meters depth of water. So in terms of, of wastewater treatment, if your tanks can only be 2.5 meters high, they have to be a large area. So in more in more densely populated countries, and we're finding Brazil is one that's asking a lot for it. Um, some countries in Europe, they want to build smaller, smaller diameter tanks, which are taller. They want to be six meters tall, three times as tall. And we can do that because we can make, make the pressure to do it. So the, the market will change a little bit, but for us, yeah, we, we have both things at the moment. We have, we have our our standard pressure level, which is higher than everybody else's. And we're now making units that simply replace the, the existing side chunk block. These are larger units, um, larger in, in our terms, still much smaller and still around um, probably 10 to 15% of the weight of competing units, which, which has advantages in every way, it, it costs less to make because it's got less material in it. It costs less to ship anywhere because it's you know, well under a quarter of the weight. It's cheaper to install because it doesn't need cranes and people can lift them. That many, many reasons why our units are saving cost. And the, the key thing, very key thing, is that we are 30 to 40% more efficient than anything else on the market. That means we use 30 to 40% less electricity. And generally speaking, if you buy a Sprintex blower, you could, depending where you are in the world and how much you pay for electricity, somewhere between four and eight months, and certainly in less than a year, you'll get your money back for the unit you purchased in the cost savings from the electricity bill. We also have a, uh, our own... Uh, system called smart pulse aeration technology. Um, what that means is because because our units don't run at a constant speed and can run uh, at variable speed and vary in speed, we're able to run for periods, you know, short periods, three to five seconds slower and three to five seconds faster. <laughs> and what that does is it, saves more energy whilst providing better aeration of the water because of course the the overall um intent here is to keep the oxygen in the water so that the uh, microorganisms can do their job in in cleaning up that water so by using our smart pulse aeration which other machines can't do because it can't manage the the sudden changes in speed we're able to increase the actual aeration efficiency or the oxygenation efficiency of the units. Again, in our bigger units, we mentioned that's a, on the right is a 25 kilowatt unit, also comes in 37 kilowatts, the same size, only 140 kilos. Something to compare with that is more than a ton, 1,200 kilos. 
actually quite a different uh, proposition. We offer people an energy savings calculator so that they can plug in their own uh, their own parameters and what they're actually doing in their current system so they can see ahead what's going to happen when they change that to a Sprint Explorer. Um, and largely, I think we're finding that people are so excited about that that level of well, the, the level of saving they're saying well that really can't be true and we need to test that so that's why we have so many um, test programs going on around the world at the moment so where are they used wastewater treatment is is a very large user of air blowers um, the world health organization tells us that there's um not enough water on the planet and that we have to recycle every bit of water we can. Um, I heard a, a statistic recently that says if, if you turn on the tap and fill up a glass of water in London, it's probably been through a human body seven times before it came to you. It's, you know, people don't realise that, but but that's the level of recycling of water that's going on in the world at the moment. And, that, and as the world population continues to rise, um, this problem is not getting any better. Europe and the and UK has terrible problems with, with waste overflow. They simply can't treat enough sewage. And you know, we see reports all the time in the UK of sewage floating in the rivers and in the ocean, people surfing and seeing sewage in the ocean. It's crazy. So it's a very big application. Um, there's also there are other aspects to wastewater treatment, a lot like the um, the Dutch agriculture system. You know, really, that's about the ammonia. The, the ammonia in the is in the water, if you like. And uh, the problem with that is, is it's evaporating into the atmosphere and causing all sorts of problems. It causes breathing problems at quite low percentages. Ammonia is quite quite uh, a nasty chemical. Um, one of the other benefits of the Dutch system is it actually not only extracts the ammonia, it, it converts it to either ammonium phosphate or ammonium nitrate, which many people might be aware are used as fertilizers in agriculture all the time. So they're, they're turning a waste product into a usable product. So in aquaculture, fish farming, the hatcheries and the grow out ponds, um, all fish need oxygen. Um, all of us have seen uh, tropical fish tanks with the bubbles coming out of the top. Um, on a larger scale, that's that's what fish need to, to stay alive. And we also know if the pump stops the fish die, that's important that our units are reliable. But something else that people probably don't think about is when you have a, a 10 or 15 watt pump on the fish tank, every bubble that goes out the surface is wasted energy, paid electricity to make those bubbles. If the bubbles go out the surface, well, they've gone back into the atmosphere where you've got the air from to start with. So that's waste. So um, if we come back to the smart pulse aeration, we're trying to make smaller bubbles. We're trying to keep them in the water longer and get the oxygen into the water instead of wasting it back into the atmosphere. So there's a lot of technology. And we're working with a couple of companies. That, um, Net Zero Energy in Turkey is one. And Eurotech in India is another. Um, they're focused on energy saving. They, they're not so focused exactly on what process you do in industry. They will come in and look at your process and say, well, by changing X, Y, and Z, we can save you 10, 12, 14% energy. And uh, those sorts of companies are, are you know, opening both arms to us because they're saying, this is something we can offer people energy saving without getting off our chair. And it's really very effective. So agriculture is used in ventilation, in the waste man management, um, chicken farming, there's dust and feathers. Uh, in food packaging, there's moisture removal and vacuum packaging are units also capable of creating vacuum. That's another big market. Food manufacturing in general, drying. We recently had a, a company come to us 
they want you know, they run hundreds and hundreds of blowers for drying tortillas. They make Mexican tortillas. That's their main business, the largest bakery in the world. And they recognize that cooling and drying tortillas um, cost them a huge amount of electricity. And they could save a lot if they change our blowers. Uh, meat processors, again, <laughs> meat processing also provides a wastewater problem in that most food factories are not allowed to put their wastewater straight into the drainage system because it's carrying too much bio load, if you like, in terms of, of what's in the water. So they have to have their own wastewater um, purification system, not to make it good enough to drink, but to make it good enough to put down the drain. So that, that's another big application for us. So food and beverage, beer making, Coca-Cola making, that sort of thing. Um, I mentioned earlier the electronics market, uh, very big in terms of printed circuit board manufacturers, uh, semiconductor manufacturers, etc. Plastics recycling uh, can physically transport the plastic pellets around the factory with air. Um, printing paper and paper manufacturing has always used air to, to move large amounts of paper around. So many, many applications and, and really the, there's, there's this statistic that says that half of all the electricity used in industry, any type of industry around the world is used to move air. So if you can imagine how much electricity industry uses, if, if we could save 30 to 40 percent of the cost to move air, it, it's a massive thing to industry. Um, well, those of you who have looked at our websites probably see them as a little bit outdated, and we are just underway with that at the moment, improving those. So back to why Sprintex and why should you why should anybody invest in a company at the moment? As I mentioned before. Um we, we're in a unique position. We, we've come from a long history of, of manufacturing twin screw compressors and we've moved into another area which has you know, very, very broad applications. And in, we're fortunate to have a, a leading technology team who've been <laughs> designing, pro they're all headhunter guys. Um, they've been designing product for European manufacturers already. So coming from some of the world's largest technology developers like Bosch and Siemens, and those sorts of people. And so we have technically a, a very advanced product. As I mentioned earlier, we have a, a jump on the rest of the market in, in applying current technology into industry <laughs> in, in terms of blowers and wastewater. So we're coming from a low base. We, we ridiculously undervalued at the moment. And just to put a frame around that, I mentioned earlier, one of the um, linear generator companies in America that we're working with, they haven't made anything yet, but they've raised more than half a billion US dollars already because they're in that square that people are very excited about clean energy. Um, we, we as a listed company uh, have had the... Um, run on reality and at times where we've had really very little actual production the market is, is fairly hard on that so we have another partner company in, in uk um <clears throat> technology development company that's also in electric motors uh they're currently valued and and in in process of a m a at, 105 million pounds pre-IPO. And we we make product for them. We design product for them. We have everything they have and more. But currently we're valued at $25 million. So that obviously is going to um, level itself out. The best way we can fix that is to, to make the company real. And over the coming year, our revenues will bring us into an area where to make that 100 million market cap by next year, the share price will be about 17 or 18 cents to achieve that. Um, we believe that's it's 
more than achievable. Uh, our forecasts show that we will uh, make about double the revenue required to meet our targets. And at that point, the share price would be more, definitely more than 17 cents. Um, obviously, all of us are incentivized to achieve that. I mentioned the chairman, the directors, every member of staff are all get, um, they all have performance rights and will all do very well if the company meets its goals. Currently, our compressor operation, including the design guys, all work in 12 hours a day because they understand that <laughs> that we've got to jump on the market and, and we need to make that count now, not, not in two years' time. Because in two years' time, other people will be starting to catch up. So we have a, a fantastic innovative technology um, and we, we're doing our best to keep keep the innovations coming and, and stay ahead of the market and we're already on to our second generation. Uh, so I think that's certainly something we're capable of. Um, and now we're developing the, the strategic partnerships, the companies like Mest and the distributors and the companies like Aristec in the UK a high technology company and companies like Ricardo, all of those key companies are, are looking to us for the, the very best compressor technology in the world, basically, which we have. So that's about all we have. I'm sorry if it's a little bit uh, long and thank and, you very uh, much for the detailed yeah, presentation, yeah. Jay. I really appreciate that one. It was very informative. Now, I've just got a couple of questions um, that we will get everything started with. And again, any participants, if you have any questions, please submit the Q&A function. I'll ask Jay. Now, Jay, just to kick things off with a bit of an elephant in the room, obviously, it does appear you guys um, have a whole lot of hands and a whole lot of pies. How are you going about uh, prioritizing specific growth targets? Right, and prioritizing different projects, you know, with ones being obviously going to be more attractive than others. Absolutely, and certainly we we are looking at the low hanging fruit. I mentioned earlier that um, clean energy is, is fantastically popular and it's a very attractive proposition, but the reality of that is it's three to five years away. Yeah. Um, in terms of any any real volume of revenue, so we we. At the moment, we have the blinkers on completely. I've mentioned previously that Steve and myself are, are the, kind of the old guys in the program. We have a, a bunch of of all of our development team and our key sales and management people are in you know, uh, half our age, and they've got a lot of energy and they want to go in every direction. So we're keeping the blinkers on. We've, we've got the reins, and we're keeping them in the right direction. We believe that the wastewater market and the industrial blower market is is will provide everything that Sprintex needs in the short term. So we're not we haven't stopped on the clean energy front, but yep. we definitely have it on on the uh, priority two, if you like. And for instance, MEST, which which we see as a as a project that, that could make the company in one step. Um we, we did we did that deal the way we did it with a with a million dollar trial. So we could prioritize it and make it number one priority in the company. And it is right now. So we, we're developing that in double quick time and we will be testing as early as next month in the Netherlands with that. Okay, well, appreciate the update on that front. Now, just shifting here, obviously with you guys bringing such a competitive edge to the market at the moment, how is Sprintex protecting its intellectual property? Uh, and what is the company's strategy to maintain your competitive edge regarding the technology moving forward? Well, as I mentioned, um, we have more than 20 patents on, on the current technology, so yep. that's a starting point. But yep. patents aren't everything by any means. Um, again, I mentioned during the presentation that currently our IP-sensitive parts, the, the very high-speed electric motors and the motor rotors, et cetera, are all built in house. It's, so it's okay. our own facility. Nothing is built by contract manufacturers. The only parts that come from contract manufacturing are simple parts that are, that are made by their millions every day. Yep. So largely, we have two of our own facilities, and everything that's IP sensitive will be done inside our own facilities. 
So that's, that's the main way we're, we're protecting IP. And in terms of development going forward, as, as I mentioned, we have um, technology companies from all over the world coming to us you know, at least once a week with, for a new company wanting um, wanting our compressors because they're the best. Uh, because of that, um, we're continually pushing the envelope on the technology side. For instance, the, the American um, linear generator people uh, they really want our controllers to run above 800 volts. Well, today the, the electronic components aren't available to do that. So we really, we've already slowed their program down a minute while we developed a new controller that went from <laughs> 790 volts. Now we're at 825 volts, but that's kind of beyond the limit, if you like. So yeah. we continue pushing the envelope, and we've and we've got applications around the world coming to us that are helping us push the envelope. Okay. Okay. Now, with you guys continuing to push the envelope and looking to go grow so quickly and so aggressively, how are you maintaining a focus and being able to acquire a really top end talent to make sure you can maintain your place at the top of the market? Well, I I think where we're located is is key for that because the Chinese government in my opinion, did a very smart thing about 15 to 20 years ago. They built a whole bunch of universities and, and made a lot more capacity to train engineers. <clears throat> now, um, at the moment, China is leading the world in electric vehicles. They're making more electric vehicles than any other country. And for that reason, that's one of the very highest um, technology divisions of industry at the moment. So there's an awful lot of people involved in that. And some of our people came from electric vehicle OEMs. And so, excuse me, largely we have a huge pool of engineering talent to draw from uh, for that. And, and, and we're attracting those people because they look at what we're doing. You know, this is very interesting and we'd like to be a part of it. And we're incentivizing our people. And we, everybody goes to work at some level to, to earn money to feed their family. So it's to incentivize people to, to come and be with us. But it's also exciting being with us because we're doing world first items, which is which is really as an engineer, it's what you want to be involved in. Of course. Of course. Well, thank you for the update on that one. Well, that wraps up all the questions from me. We've just got one here from the participants. Now, uh this gentleman asks uh, when you expect uh Sprint Text to be profitable or when you expect uh, it to be cash flow positive. This quarter, we should deliver a cash flow positive. We, we were close on the last quarter, and we will be cash flow positive this quarter. We have to be. We, yeah, it's not far to June 2025, 20, which um, will be a profitable year, and it will be um, above our $20 million threshold for, for the um, performance rights for both directors and staff. Okay. Well, thank you for the update in that regard. Now, Joe, before we wrap things up, is there anything you'd like to leave us with? I'm sorry, go again. Is there anything you'd like to leave us with? Well, I, for mine, it, I think the key thing is to look at just how undervalued Sprintex is. You know, if, if you look at other companies developing technology in, in the same sphere, and many of those companies rely on us, you know, the, the two that there are two large developments going on in America for linear, linear generators. Both of them will raise an awful lot of money, and both of them independently. The, it's very interesting. Neither of those companies even knew each other, so they were quite shocked when, when I said to one of them, "Well, we're doing a, a compressor for another linear generator." And they said, oh, "What's that?" They didn't even know about them. But there's two large, and they. Both ended up at Sprintex because Sprintex is the only company that's what they need. And it's, it's the same in fuel cells. Fuel cells are all about efficiency, all about lightweight, et cetera. So we, again, we build the smallest, the lightest. So we have what, it, what these companies have. The benefit that, that some of these development companies have is they're not publicly listed and not publicly traded. So they're not open to the vagaries of the stock market and, and what can happen if you like and you know, we went through a thing the second half of last year where a group 
pushed our shares down to 20% of what they were. We've recovered that now because those people are gone. <coughs> um, and now we are at a point where I think, you yeah, know, we've got some profit taking going at the moment because early this year we were trading at one and a half cents and now we're trading at six. So there are some people taking profits from that. But I think the new generation of investor coming in now should understand that the company, it's not a five cent company, you know, it's a 50 cent company and it will be a 50 cent company. It might not be in five minutes, but it's gonna be. Well, thank you very much for your time and consideration, Dave. Really appreciate the expertise. Um, yeah, Sprintex seems absolutely fascinating. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention and thank you very much, Jay, again, for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers. Thank you, guys.